Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hot Topics for MSPs in 2021. We're going to be talking automation, SLAs, and knowledge transfer today in the webinar. My name is Tabitha Ishman, and I'm the Marketing Manager of Excalibur Data Systems, and I just wanted to welcome all of you to be here with us today and then to talk about a few logistics before we go ahead and get started. The lines are muted and the webinar is being recorded. The recording will be sent via email to all participants tomorrow. We'll also answer questions at the end in a Q&A session, and you can ask questions at any time during the presentation just by typing them into the question window. Now I'm gonna jump into a little bit about Excalibur Data Systems. We are a leading edge consulting firm guiding organizations through their digital transformation journey. We work with strategic partners like Dry Ice by HCL Technologies and leverage best of breed enterprise service management technologies. In doing so, we also help create next generation solutions for our customers. So I'm going to introduce Raj Jathar from Dry Ice to tell us a little bit more. So I welcome Raj. Thank you, Tabitha. So without further ado, Dry Ice is a division of HCL Technologies, uh, which itself is a 10 plus billion dollar enterprise. Um, it's been, Dry Ice has been in existence for over 20 years um, with a global presence across 100 plus customers. Um, we've been developing these solutions for over eight years now in partnership with um, uh, universities as well as um, research outfits uh, with about 500 plus um, AI uh, enthusiasts uh, developing this on a regular basis. Me, thank you. Um, so Dry Ice, is, Dry Ice has a very wide um, portfolio of uh, products and platforms uh, across three uh, verticals um, or domains, if you will. Um, AI ops service orchestration and business process flow monitoring. Uh, I won't go into each one individually, but suffice it to say that they are geared towards um, doing more with less and enabling enterprises undergo digital transformation, um, be more efficient while reducing cost and uh, managing risk. The um, solution that we're gonna talk about in particular today, among other things, is the uh, dry ice um, I automate solution, which is um, an AI powered runbook automation or intelligent automation solution. Well, thank you, Raj. Uh, I am Mike Fuson from Excalibur Data Systems, uh, joining Raj here for our presentation today, uh, talking about hot topics for MSPs in 2021 automation, SLAs, and knowledge transfer. Uh, this is an exciting topic for us to get into. Um, as to you know, how do we uh, become more effective uh, as MSPs. So we have actually have a poll um, that we'd like to ask Tabitha to pop up for us. And do you know what runbook automation is? So Tabitha, if you could pop that poll for us, that would be fantastic. All right, so a little bit no, um, that's uh, not an uncommon uh, answer to that particular poll. Um, I'm seeing a question here from Kieran that he's not hearing the audio. Um, uh, Nina or Jeffrey, are you able to hear the audio? Uh, you can use the Q&A to tell us or use the chat uh, to, to tell us that you can hear the audio. Uh, Nina said right. she can hear. She can hear okay. the audio. Okay, great. Um, so Tabitha, let's uh, let's go ahead and 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 pop our next poll here, uh, which is what do some of you think are some of the challenges around running uh, operations in today's environment? So Tabitha has popped up in that poll a, a very tight uh, windows for level one, uh, insufficient information for triage. You know, pick pick one or many. Uh, of those uh, items for us, uh, and that will kind of help us uh, uh, make sure we we focus on, a, 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 on some of the right things for you 
because there's a, there's a lot that we can talk about and we only have so much time to to get through all of the details. Mm -hmm. All right, so you know tight windows for level one, um, proliferation of applications that need to be and 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 challenging challenges with budgets, Raj. So nothing super uh, uh, super unexpected there. Uh, right. Things that we we typically see as as some of the common uh, challenges that, that that we as MSPs face. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about uh, what those challenges are for MSPs. So Raj, you guys I know uh, yeah. at Dry Ice have just done tons and tons of research in the market. So talk to us a little bit right. about what you guys are seeing out there. Absolutely. So the poll results actually line up um, very well with the research that um, we have. Um, uh, done and and some of the research firms have told us, um, which essentially boils down to the fact that CIOs um, are going to be chartered with uh, making technology decisions and um, and are going to have to adjust to the new normal. And the way in which they're going to have to do that is they're going to have to manage costs, which essentially we're not talking about uh, managing it in, in terms of right sizing it, but really reducing it while still maintaining or increasing efficiency. And all of this um, while also mitigating risk, right? Now, managing cost and efficiency, um, we, we already know how to do that. But the question is, how do you do that while still mitigating risk, right? Now, if I was to put my uh, CIO ha hat on for a moment, right, I'm thinking to myself, well, um, I've got to do this. But at the same time, I'm also learning. The research firms are also telling me that if we resist embracing digital products or channels, that we're going to be disrupted, which is just a nice way of saying you're not going to be in the market anymore. You're not going to be a player anymore. And the two of them seem to be at odds with each other, right? So as a CIO, if I'm putting my hat on and if I have a large part of my operations that's outsourced, one of the first things that I might think about doing is, well, you know, should I insource it? Should I bring that back in, right? And would it be possible for me to perhaps save some um, of my and cut some of my expenses by bringing it in there. Maybe I can do it more efficiently than uh, the provider who I'm outsourcing this out to. Uh, um, maybe I can. Uh, maybe I don't need all the services that I need. Maybe I can bring some part of this in house. Regardless of what the, um, the, the CIO might end up doing, uh, what this will definitely call into question is any additional projects that have not been kicked out. Uh, kicked off that might have been kicked off with with MSPs, right? Those also are now under threat because now I'm sitting there going, do I really want to do this this year? Maybe I'll I'll hold off on doing this, and and maybe I'll try and undertake some of this transformation in house before I kick it out to an MSP. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, you know, it, it, certainly with uh, 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 our our 2020, uh, you know, uh, I always call it kind of BC before coronavirus. Things worked a certain way, and now we've got this new way of operating. And organizations are are, are always looking to manage their costs, but uh, uh, you know many of our customers are on kind of that where can we cut uh, sort of scenario. And I know we've kind of got another slide here that that dives a little deeper into this, where, we're, where our mm -hmm. challenges while running these operations, right, right. from an IT infrastructure, IT operations, and and also our cultural transformation. On this, let's talk a little bit about this, Raj, and kind of put it in context yep. for everyone. Oh, absolutely, right. So, at, at a very high level, you know, you're talking about reducing costs while increasing efficiency, right? But what does that mean uh, for the boots on the ground, for the actual operations teams that are, are running um, uh, and, and keeping the lights on, right? Um, now, bringing down uh, the the cost of this uh, of operations means you're going to have to cut corners somewhere, right? But if you cut uh, too much and if you cut too quickly, now you're increasing risk, right? So mitigating risk while doing all of this, they're kind of opposing forces, right? They're at odds with each other. Uh, so that's one of the challenge. Um, and, and in addition to that, and I'm gonna uh, touch on a number of challenges and, and before I, I go through all of them, uh, I want to point out that these are not challenges that are orthogonal to each other, um, right? These are challenges that actually compound each other. So with each and every one of these, right, it's a force multiplier on top of the one before it. And, and so it makes things exponentially um, more difficult. So one of the challenges is the lack of self-service, right? Um, if 
uh, operations cannot serve themselves, then they have to turn to SMEs or they have to turn to an authoritative source uh, for anything and everything. Um, right? So that increases the volume uh, where, con where those sources are concerned. Um, in addition to this, there is, we've seen that there has been a large uptick in the volume of tickets and the volume of incidents, which is no surprise as, um, as people are remote and, and trying to come to grips with running operations remotely. And it's not just existing categories of tickets that have had a higher uptick in volume. What we're seeing is entirely new categories of tickets, right? Um, tickets that are around um, the fact that a lot of applications, a lot of workflow, a lot of the operations weren't actually designed for folks to be remote. Right. Um, so there's a whole uh, new category of, of tickets around uh, latency issues with applications and bandwidth issues and network issues and VPN and and uh, and security, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so all of this, what what that results in is that the SMEs uh, were already burdened prior to, as you said, BC, um, right, uh, are stretched even thinner uh, than they were before. And they didn't have bandwidth before, so you know there's only so much blood that you can squeeze out of that stone. Now, on top of all of this, as if that isn't challenge enough, right? We talked about you have to do all of this remotely, and one of the uh, one of the differences and and the challenges with running operations remotely, other than the obvious ones, which is the fact that um, you cannot just walk down the hall and tap somebody on the shoulder um, and ask them a question. Um, right, collaboration becomes much harder. You cannot all just get into a conference room and huddle. Sure, you can, you know, you can get uh, folks on a Zoom call, but you know, when you actually have to ping people in order to get them on, as opposed to I can see who's there and who isn't on the actual floor within the actual knock, right? It's completely different. Um, there's also another insidious effect to all of this, which doesn't get talked about enough, um, to my mind, right? Which is that when you have an operations room and you have people on the floor, um, you can see who's there. And what you might do is choose the path of least resistance to getting a question answered or an issue addressed. And so what I might do is I might find the closest person to me who uh, I think can help me with this, right? Now with everybody being remote and my not knowing who's around, guess what I'm gonna do if I have a question or I have um, uh, something that I need addressed? I'm gonna to go to the highest possible authority on that topic, right? So everybody is now hounding this one guy for questions when there are 10 or 15 or who knows how many others who could answer those um, if people were actually on the floor and could see that happening, right? So my path of least resistance is to go straight to the top, um, right? Which goes right back to my earlier comment about SMEs and being completely buried. So instead of doing what they should be doing, which is enhancing your offerings, um, you know, uh, writing applications, upgrading, uh, et cetera, uh, doing things to, to better your operations environment. All they're doing is just reacting, they're just reacting. It's a constant mode of break fix, right? So all of this, if I put it together, um, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand that the impact, the implications of this is you're going to have, it's going to affect your availability and performance, it's going to increase, it's going to send your MTTR through the roof, you're going to breach all sorts of SLAs, even if you have a very understanding client who, you know, yes, we understand it's, it's, um, it's no longer BC, and so, you know, we're not going to have the same SLAs and we're going to have uh, longer response times, etc. But, you know, in inevitably, it's going to result in decreased customer satisfaction because it's not going to be, you're not going to be slightly off, you're going to be way off. You're going to have unresolved um, incidents. And at the end of the day, you're just going to burn people up, uh, right? Because all they're doing 24 by seven is just constantly fighting fires. And a lot of the things that they're doing, they're not complex problems. They're really, really mundane stuff. Hey, I need to restart this, but I don't have the authority to do so. Hey, I need to, uh, I need more compute resource over here, or, or I need this server uh, moved into this VPN or this access control list. I need to add an IP address to it. You know, just very, very mundane things like that. Yeah, it, 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 you know, uh, certainly I know for, for many of our customers, um, you know, MSPs and, and, you know, normal businesses alike, um, that they've all seen this, sh this shift you're talking about, which is, we, we've got a higher ticket volume, and that higher ticket volume 
that we're seeing come in are all stuff that we didn't really deal with, right. you know, prior to these, you know, prior to the work from home. And all of the things that we were used to being able to do, like you said, I think about things like um, when you look at a typical service desk, certain uh, personnel on that service desk may have a higher level of expertise with, with say, an internal application, right? I may be a newer guy. I haven't dealt with the accounting system a lot, yeah. but if I come over to Raj, Raj has a lot of experience and kind of knows some tricks to maybe help overcome a, a challenge. And I can very easily tap Raj on the shoulder to ask a question, or Raj may take the call over for me and kind of keep me in that uh, if our, 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 our mechanisms and our metrics allow it, kind of that first call res where it stays with the service desk. Um, and you know that our MTTR is quicker, our SLA is met, customer satisfied, problem solved. Um, but I don't have that now because what am I doing? I'm sitting at my desk at home or my kitchen table um, as a service desk person. And I don't necessarily always know who's on, who's available because I can't just look around. Um, right. And we've got all these new things that we're dealing with. Uh, with, uh, I think of a couple of our customers, um, one in particular that we kind of um, te tease one of our customers about, uh, they were very uh, adamant about um, uh, one of our personnel being on site for some of the services um, uh, that Excalibur specializes in. Um, and not a huge issue. Uh, he happens to be local to them, 10 minutes away, um, not a real big deal. And then everybody was forced to work from home. And they are now saying, "Wow, this is really nice." You know, some of the 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 the, the crazy meetings that we have, we don't have anymore because it's more difficult to coordinate a meeting. And you know, yeah. we're we're this is this is you know, we still can communicate and collaborate, um, but we're able to get more done. Except now, I don't have access to this because I'm in the wrong VPN group, or um, you know, my uh, you know my internet is flaky. I think about you know that thing as a service desk person. Um, at an MSP or or at a corporate customer, where how often were you really dealing with somebody's home internet issues? And now all of a sudden you're dealing with everybody's home internet issues. Right. Um, right. And you know, and, and they're not you know, they they know whether it's working or not working, and um, you know, uh, uh, aren't, aren't thinking about things like uh, you know, uh, us that are kind of more more uh, t technical nerdy type people. Um, if I'm working from home. Uh, and all of a sudden, I see my performance slow way down. Uh, my my son gets an immediate uh, text message that says, "Get off your Xbox. You're supposed to be, you know, paying attention in, in class." Because I could go yeah. look at my statistics, and I'm like, oh, "Yeah, it's not uh, that's not Zoom that's going on there. Um, right. Things that are consuming bandwidth." And, and and all of a sudden, for for folks that maybe work from home occasionally, um, and we're used to that, well, they work from home, but the kids were at school. You know, a uh, spouse might have been at their job and now all of a sudden spouse is at home, kids are at home, everybody's online. Um, and we as as first level support and then our escalation paths are all now having to kind of help work around those things. And we're limited on what we can do. But then we've got, the, you know, the, 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 those day to day mundane things. I need access to X, Y, Z application and you've got to be in a different VPN group uh, in order to do that. But as a service test technician, I don't have the ability to move you or put you in the correct security. However, our VPN is set up. I don't have access to the VPN or I can't uh, change your security group in the AD. Um, and the security, you know, our, our, our internal security team is going, least use rights, least use rights, least use rights, right? Uh, especially now, you know, because we're, we're now all distributed and we want to control that even more tightly than we might have before. And so you've got all of these competing um, uh, uh, efforts and competing goals within the organization, how do we make that easy? So now everything gets escalated to level two and there's only so many level two people. And then right. you know, they, they handle those issues, but all of a sudden their volume of what used to be 20 uh, uh, incidents a day is now 50 incidents a day. And there's only time to get through 25. And so you start to have you know, that ripple effect, uh, that drag that gets, that gets put on all of the teams. I think I think our next slide um, really kind of starts to illustrate um, yep. the, the the models and how the models have shifted. So right. you know, our traditional employee care model, things come into uh, our service desk, uh, and you know we're we're all shooting for 
for first call resolution. I gave, you know, there's many different definitions for that. Is it never leaves the service desk or it's resolved actually on the first call, whatever your definition is. But the um, service desk is always, right, trying to resolve that on the first call within the service desk and not having to escalate. Now we have, and then, then you have your escalation to um, your engineering teams and then your level three es escalation and above to super specialists. And so you start to get mm -hmm. to smaller numbers of people as you start to move, move up the food chain. Right. And so that would be a, a 15 minute, half hour, hour call on the service desk, you know, a few more hours for response from say a, a escalation team in the traditional model, and then maybe a day or two if the technical specialists have to get involved because there's actually something more complicated or a change, more complicated change that needs to be made. Yeah. Um, and the goal that we really have is to try to start to shift this to a smarter model. And this is where iAutomate starts to help us. And we, 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 we you know, shift left, you know, uh, in, in the BC times, you know, before coronavirus was a yeah. big topic, especially around uh, knowledge management, right? Putting knowledge out there for our uh, customers to consume, um, having knowledge available for them to self-resolve. Um, and, you know, shift left now becomes a very much broader perspective um, because we're really looking at call deflection in a broader way, not just necessarily uh, the knowledge that's out there, but also starting to empower our level one and even our level zero, um, and you look at that as more of a self-service model. So I come into uh, my organizations, or or as an MSP, they they are able to come into uh, your uh, self-service portal, um, and they're opening uh, an, an incident or they're opening a request. Mm -hmm. One of our goals is to start to shift that left and leveraging a platform like iAutomate uh, and the smart runbooks and the smart technology that's available, which we're going to talk a little more about in detail, um, starts to allow you to shift that stuff out. So from a self-help perspective, um, I need you know, uh, this level of access within the VPN, and I choose that from my selections. This now right. can actually be go through an approval process. Maybe my manager has to approve it uh, or whatever our approval steps are the proper approvals are, are received, and now automation takes over to move me into the correct uh, security group or, or, or change something in the VPN or whatever it is to give me appropriate rights. Or could be multiple steps, you know, um, adding me uh, as a user to that system or w whatever may need to be done. And so now we're, now we're very quickly taking care of that, notifying the employee that we resolve that issue, and they're able to move on. So when you start to look at your your MTTRs, your, your CSAT, um, your SLAs, those things are addressed very, very quickly. And the, the same thing can be held true of them calling in to the service desk, because as we all know, um, we can shift left and have the most wonderful, capable portal in the world, and you still have a portion of your customers that are gonna refuse, mm -hmm. simply right. refuse to actually okay. leverage that portal. They're just right. not going to wanna work with that portal uh, and they're going to call. Um, I, we kind of joke with customers uh, uh, when, when you have the ability to email in for tickets, right? And, that, and that's been maybe around in the organization for a while, and you start to turn that off to shift them to the portal. Um, you can start making bets of who are going to be the holdouts to the very end that are still emailing in tickets, even though they're getting, every time they get an auto response saying, this is going away in two days. This is going away in one day. Um, and so the idea is to start to shift that Mm -hmm. and leverage this automation, but that same automation yeah. that we're, can, we can trigger from a self-service perspective, we can mm -hmm. also empower our level one technicians to be able to trigger that because these are right. things that have been uh, reviewed and approved, level one, right. or level two, level three, on up our food chain is that these are the steps that need to be taken. And from a security perspective, you're not having to give me any more rights right. um, than I may otherwise need because those are very, uh, uh, specific sets of steps or scripts or whatever it is they need to be, um, and those can ha those can be executing proper uh, security rights without me having to ha have my security elevated. Uh, and so all of a sudden, if I need to do that, I can simply select the correct uh, action to take, 
and you're now you now have the access that you need or um, you're in the correct security group or uh, right. whatever action may need to be taken is taken um, and we're talking about really here the interaction that personnel have with the service desk or with our IT service management system you're taking this a step further in really from an automation perspective uh, looking at this also from the events that occur right and it's something you know Raj you and I have talked about extensively um, inside of an organization you know uh, a certain percentage of your stuff is the uh, is the customer and the user asking for things uh, either from a request perspective or something is broken in, a, in an incident perspective yeah. but you also have your systems uh, right. that are also calling in and saying um, uh, you know your monitoring system is now opening an incident because a particular service has gone down uh, or uh, there's there's other monitoring information that says hey we're about to have a problem whatever the case may be uh, and that's creating that 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 incident record in your incident management system and these same automations can be applied to that situation where we're able to take the actions that are needed um, to uh, possibly have nobody aware that there was a temporary service outage that the um, database for the uh, accounting system briefly uh, may have may have gone offline because the service stopped um, right. we already have a, an automation that's taken an action restarted that service and they go oh Maybe that was just a hiccup in the VPN or whatever. They're they're somewhat unaware. And as MSPs, you know, what is our primary responsibility? You know, um, we 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 kind of jokingly talked about our QBRs, right? You want to go to the QBR with your list of here's all of the problems that we either prevented or took care of as part of this. And the client, on the other hand, is saying we don't think you did anything. Right. Everything seemed yeah. to just run perfectly, right? right. That's the ultimate yeah. goal. Here are the things yeah. that we're doing for you that are avoiding your downtime, uh, your em you know, employee frustration, uh, et cetera. But as MSPs, we only have so much uh, horsepower to go around. Uh, right. One of the challenges that, that, that we face is, you know, we, we have that same saturation point. We can't just right. continue to escalate stuff up. And right. our escalation is not just for, when you think about it from a corporate perspective, which this platform certainly works well in, but you start to extend right. it to an MSP, we have, you know, 50, 100, you know, hundreds of clients. Um, and some of them have all the same same issues because everybody that's got Office 365, you know, a, a mailbox size increase works the same for all of them. So we have right. things that can be replicated, but we can also have the things that are very personal, very specific to a particular customer. And yeah. we start to avoid those escalations for things that are common um, mm -hmm. at the same time we're also uh, helping to uh, alleviate some of those things that we're supposed to be watching for, which is the uh, uh, the 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 the, the um, our monitoring systems. If we're running them, or the customers' monitoring systems, notifying us of an issue, yeah. uh, helps us if we're providing the L1 help desk, or it helps us if we're providing certain services to that customer to be able to take those actions very very quickly and put those actions in the hands of folks um, that may not actually know what right. steps to take. I kind of used the example, it's always a simple example that I use in a lot of cases of increasing a, a mailbox size. There's mm -hmm. nothing super difficult about it. You could teach exactly. anyone how to do it, you know, but it takes 17 steps because you know well, Microsoft likes to make it fun. Now, now you know, the more advanced folks, they write a PowerShell script and you know, they, they know that stuff, but that's not what everybody else knows. You use the GUI, right. you go in, you click a few buttons and you dig into it and you make a change right. and you know, boom, it's done. But that still takes you six, seven, eight minutes every time you've got to go do that. Um, we now empower everybody if they didn't even know how to get into that. And you think about an MSP. Oh, shoot, which customer am I getting into? Are they part of our Office 365 right. infrastructure as we right. resell that? Or they have their, you know, they're they're an, uh, an E3 or an E5 customer that has their own infrastructure. So I've got to go over there. What are the what are the usernames right. and passwords to get in over there? And you know, all those things yep. start to become non-issues because we've already built a structure of which all that user needs to do um, is make the request, and we can automatically, with the proper approval, usually increase mm -hmm. that mailbox size. Um, and so to to the customer all of the things that are challenges are now all met you know better csat mean time to resolution it got done 
you know, what may have seemed like in minutes, except for that manager that wants to sit on it for two days to approve it. Right. We can control that, but it's easy enough for us to demonstrate. Usually doesn't hurt our SLA because it's awaiting an approval. Um, right. But uh, we've started to drive things forward and we didn't have to have a technician jump in every time. The only time they have to jump in, unfortunately with Microsoft products, is when the automation throws an error, which, you know, 98 times out of 100 is going to go perfectly, but those two times, right. now somebody jumps in. But now we're talking a much smaller volume and that yeah. manageable volume. And then our level twos and our level threes are doing the things you talked about that are most important to the organization, um, which is starting to, to look at what are the other things that could potentially be automated? What are right. the other things that we can do? What's next? We need to upgrade this client. I think about um, our the accounting firm that's next door to us in, in our building. Um, starting their move to Office 365. You're able to have the right personnel and the right resources and, and enough resources to focus on that project. Um, mm -hmm. And they're not just kind of keeping the lights on and um, just trying to you know, uh, keep things from becoming overwhelming. So it starts to drive uh, you know, that stuff forward. And so what does that start to do for us, right? That starts mm -hmm. to look at our, our incident, uh, our issues and our problems. We start to see that downtrend. Um, on uh, those things, you know, coming down um, and and being under control, and our customer experience and customer sat starting to drive upwards, um, and uh, you know the, the 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 powers that be when you're doing your QBR are hearing, hey, we're getting some very very good things out of. Um, uh, you know, what uh, the, the folks at Excalibur, you know, if we were an MSP, um, are able to do for us. Um, you know, you got, you got good, good CSAT scores, but you're able to go in and say, here are all the issues we took care of. And most of them you didn't even know you had. Or, um, uh, you know, here's the volume of things that went on. Because I think sometimes uh, customers don't realize the volume of things that are happening within an environment, just in the day-to-day -day requests that right. occur and uh this is our goal right is mm -hmm. is starting yep. to drive this stuff forward and yep. so yep. Let, let's talk let, let's talk a little bit about really uh the ahead automation and really intelligent automation right yep. we're talking about yep. so much more than just a traditional run book just a set of steps right. that are going right. to occur there's more right. that's being brought to the table here with i automate right. so talk to us a little that's bit right. about that Absolutely. So uh, the, the the example that you gave, like that's a great example, right? Somebody writing a PowerShell script in order to increase mailbox size, right? There's your runbook automation. So there is now a runbook for increasing your um, uh, your mailbox size. However, um, if somebody was to open a ticket saying, "Hey, I need more room in my my mailbox, or I need a mailbox size increase." Somebody still has to read that ticket. Somebody still has to process it, understand what the user is asking for, who they, uh, who it is that's asking, uh, what they're asking about, what it acts on, etc. And then uh, still has to go off and execute it, right? So that's so that first order of automation where you write that shell script, that's your runbook automation. The intelligent automation that we're talking about now is the automation of that automation or the orchestration of that automation or the execution of that automation in an automated fashion, understanding what that request was, understanding what the incident was, and then automating it. So with all of these challenges that we've talked about and all of the volume, it's no longer um, a luxury to have this. It, it's absolutely become a necessity. It's almost mandatory to have this. You're gonna say something? So yeah, so let's ask our, let's ask our audience a question. What is intelligent automation to you? And Tabitha, if you could pop this poll open for us. Thank you, Tabitha. Is it just runbook automation? Is it, you know, runbook with a little AI orchestrating? Is there such a thing as intelligent automation? Is there any intelligent life out there? Um, love to hear from you uh, uh, what, uh, what, what you think it is. All right, so Tabitha, yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, it is run book automation, but it is run book automation with some AI added in, um, and it is or orchestrating. So it's all of these things kind of put together to really drive us forward. 
so let's talk a little bit about that, Raj, with the closed loop remediation and where dry ISI automate really brings some power to our organization. That's it. So, um, you know, Mike, I'm old enough to remember a time when performance monitoring and management only related to networks and it was layer two and layer three and you talked about frames and packets and that was all that there was to it uh, right and then um, you added in servers you added in the applications uh, that ran on top of them and um, you worked your way uh, further and further up the stack so as you added more and more things that you wanted to monitor uh, this this created more and more events that you had to uh, watch out for Right. Um, and then when things would go awry, uh, right, being able to sift through all of these events and figure out uh, off all of these events, which one is the actual root cause and which ones are symptoms um, of that particular root cause. Right? That became uh, a bit of an art. And then we realized, well, it doesn't have to be an art. You can actually apply some science to it. Right. So there was automation applied to that where you automatically had a root cause analysis engine. Um, you know, however it figured it out, whether it understood your topology or dependencies or whatever the case may be, right? Uh, we got more and more sophisticated um, and we automated that part of the process where you could take hundreds of events and it would spit out a single event saying that this is your incident and everything else, I'm gonna suppress this because these are all symptoms of that particular incident, right? That was the first level of automation that we achieved in sophistication. Um, the next step became and this is Gartner's model of, uh, of incident, the incident management life cycle that I'm walking uh, us through, right? And Gartner says that there's three phases to it. One is the monitoring phase, which is what I'm touching on. And then the next phase of it, once you've identified it, that particular incident, is to, um, if you're integrated with an ITSM solution, um, then you automatically create a ticket, or if you're not quite that sophisticated, somebody gets the alert and then goes off and manually creates the ticket. But either way, um, that ticket is created and now it's official, you have an incident, right? Um, so it's in the ITSM solution and um, now somebody has to act on it, um, right? And, and what would end up happening in a lot of cases um, is that even though you have achieved all of this and you managed to take what used to take somebody hours, you know, um, uh, conference room by village uh, type of figuring out what was the root cause, you reduce all of that that time to uh, a matter of just minutes, um, you still hadn't quite gotten there yet because now it could end up sitting in that, that queue in, that, uh, in your service desk, in your ITSM solution for hours, maybe days, right? Um, on that shift left slide, the top of the, um, the level three, we had, it said two days. That two days wasn't created in a vacuum. Believe it or not, we actually talked to multi, multi-billion dollar oil and gas company their P1s very often would sit in a queue for, believe it or not, two days waiting for somebody to look at them, right? Um, so it's incredible. So all of this automation doesn't amount to a hill of beans unless somebody looks at it right away, right? Now, let's say somebody does look at it right away. In the beginning, once somebody uh, uh, acknowledged, yes, you know, I, I have this incident now, I'm working on it. The next step they would have to take is try to figure out what exactly is the issue over here. Um, once they've understood the issue, once they've understood what that issue pertains to, the entity in question, now I've got to figure out how to remedy it, right? I've got to figure out how to fix it. In the beginning, before there were uh, prescribed remedies, somebody with expertise had to remediate it, and then you would hope that they would document it so that the next person coming along didn't have to go through that entire process uh, that they went through. So you had physical runbooks where people would actually write stuff down. This is how you remediate it, right? Um, then with the next level of automation, people wrote that same PowerShell script that you alluded to, right? And, and automated the, the remediation of that uh, particular incident or that particular service request in that case, right? So that was a first step, runbook automation. However, uh, the intelligent automation that we're talking about and what iAutomate brings to the table is the uh, uh, automation of all of those steps that the operator takes between actually getting that ticket in his queue, seeing it, understanding it, acknowledging it, working on it, um, identifying what's the entity, identifying what's the uh, what that entity is suffering from or the issue that needs to be addressed, 
then identifying a solution, executing that solution, validating that the solution has actually worked, and then closing out the ticket, uh, potentially with notes saying, okay, uh, this, this incident has been addressed, it has been fixed. All of those steps, the automation of those steps that an operator typically takes, that's what Ionate brings to the table. That, that's what we're talking about when we talk about intelligent operation. So being able to do that in an automated fashion, especially for mundane tasks like password resets and mailbox uh, size increases, uh, server restarts, uh, application restarts, uh, et cetera. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to tie up your high level resources doing mundane things like that when you can automate all of those. Well, and I get to be Billy Mays for a moment, right? But wait, there's more. Um, uh, I automate uh, is not uh, not, not just the, 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 the runbook um, automation, right? Because we've had runbook automation, RPAs have been around for a while, robotic process automation. Uh, and, and when you start to think about robotic process automation, you and I were talking about the example of, you know, the robot uh, at the, uh, the auto factory that's going to do its weld and it's going to do its, its movement in a very, very particular way. Uh, and that's what we want. From a runbook, we want it to take certain steps in a certain order, and that's great. But when do you know? How do we find these runbooks? And that's one of the things that iAutomate brings to the table is a library of common runbooks yep. uh, that 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 folks will use. Um, so you're not building a lot of the most common things just out of the gate. Obviously, every organization is going to have unique things that they're they're going to put in there, or they're going to take this base and they're going to add some steps to it if that's their process. Um, but it gives us that capability. But one of the things we also talked about, you know, you look at the, um, the, the, the common things that go on. So if I put a service request in for a mailbox size increase, um, that's, you know, I've got enough uh, detail in there and how I'm uh, encoding that, say, in the self-service platform, or even if I'm a technician putting it in, I have classifications. That's going to always trigger that runbook. But when you start to look at the power we're looking to get from this, which is some of the things that come from our monitoring engines, where things that we right. may not know are going on, um, like you said, you know, you get you you have one uh, uh, alert that really is the core issue, but the other alerts are a symptom uh, of that issue. Okay, now I'm gonna these other alerts are popping off because the service went down. Um, one of the things that we find with the, the, because many organizations run multiple monitoring engines, um, that actual alert that they're looking at could actually read differently. What Microsoft right. says the alert is, is one thing, um, say from the, okay. the, the Microsoft uh, uh, system log uh, sort of perspective, but SCOM may say it's something yep. else. And you know, Insert yep. your favorite monitoring tool name here, uh, may have it phrased a little differently. What we've yep. got is we've got AI built into the iAutomate platform and we've got yeah. natural language processing. So it's looking at it and saying, okay, what is this really? And right. it could be phrased in a number of different ways, but it's always going to come back to recommending the same runbook. Yep. Yep, absolutely. And and also um, it learns over time, right? So the more um, an operator picks one of its suggestions, uh, if it uh, offers up multiple suggestions, it, it it records that and it and it, it, its confidence <clears throat> excuse me in that particular solution increases so as it increases over time you can converge a lot of these incidents and service requests to a particular runbook and you can get to the point where you can set a threshold and say hey if it's 99 percent certain that that's the remedy for it then go ahead and and execute it don't even involve me in the decision to pull the trigger right and that's your fully automated mode so it's, it's, it's literally almost like um, every one of your operators has an SME for that particular incident sitting next to them on 24 by seven, always available, uh, right? That you can turn to so that you don't bother the actual SMEs, right? And, and have that pyramid of, uh, of requests going up and, and at that bottleneck of that one person. So being able to do that, being able to offer up solutions for things that they may not be uh, a, a ready remedy for, right? Being able to scrape uh, knowledge sites, whether they're uh, on your internet or whether externally, whether it's a Microsoft development site or, uh, or GitHub or whatever the case may be, being able to crawl those 
using that same NLP that you alluded to in order to be able to understand and identify that this could be a potential remedy for this particular solution and then offer it up to the operator saying, hey, um, I didn't find any existing runbooks, but I found this. Um, and, and then if the operator says, yes, this is what I'm going to incorporate now, you've, you've expanded your knowledge library. So, you know, there, there's a centralized uh, location that you can go to uh, an authoritative source for uh, remedies, uh, which keeps also growing and learning and expanding over time, uh, as is the confidence in the existing solutions. So, so yeah, when, uh, when I start exactly. to... Yeah, I start to look at that, you know, uh, as, a, as a Excalibur was an MSP for many, many years. And I start to look at that as what power to, would that bring to me as an MSP. Um, and we've got our monitoring engines running for our, our various customers. We're collecting that data. Um, that lets me use a broader array of personnel to deal with those things. We have some that are going to trigger, you know, they're going to trigger uh uh, uh, incidents and based on confidence levels may take automatic actions, but the ones that don't, I start to be able to drive to solutions rather than, than trying to rely on good old Google um, and hope I get the context correct. Um, right. We're right. leveraging um, the power of, of, of AI and the platform to, to, to say, hey, do I already have something that may I think may, may work? Or here's some other things that you may want to take a look at. And I take a look at that and maybe I am escalating uh, up to, to, to my team, but my escalation is yeah. a little bit different. Hey, here's a couple of things that were recommended. Yeah, well, you would do number three. Um, we've taken care of that. Okay, can we turn that into um, a set of steps? And you, again, you start to lower um, your mean time to resolution for many of those things. And we start to drive value as an MSP. Um, and you know, let's not forget, you know, we, we have fo folks that are corporate entities that are on here with us too, that you know, that starts to drive uh, uh, you know, same same values can be used from a corporate perspective, right. but from an right. MSP, you're dealing with 18 different customers. Now, chances are, for many of those type of items, you're going to see those potentially raised at another customer. There's a, there's a lot of commonality, except for those systems that are very very unique. There's a lot of common systems um, that that work across customer bases. So we're able to kind of uh, really exponentially uh, enhance our capabilities as an MSP to have, you know, a tool, uh, you know, a silver bullet, if, if you will, um, to solve some of those things that come up. And as we increase, you know, that score, as you said, our confidence in that resolution, we have a trigger uh, point that we can set where that now becomes an automatic action it takes. And then if it doesn't right. work, now it's kicking it out and saying, okay, now somebody needs to look at it. So how many more incidents have we now shifted left Right. for ourselves yeah right yep. these are those things that are being automatically raised um because that's what our job is as an msp we're you know client doesn't want to deal with it they want us to deal with it now we have the ability to start to shift left for ourselves and provide more value because at the end of the day as an msp um it's it's always interesting to kind of look at the model you know our goal is to touch as little as we possibly can how can we leverage a tool like you know i automate to help us drive that value to the customer, provide the value, the value for dollars. So they see a good ROI on their investment in us. Um, but at the same time, I'm lowering my cost to deliver services to that customer, which is gonna increase my margin um, uh, for that customer. And you know, margins uh, uh, in the MSP business, I remember starting in it when it was kind of a new thing, you know, margins were fairly healthy. Um, it's become somewhat of a more mature business and you can liken it to a grocery store. You know, grocery store margins are somewhat slim, but they they do make money. Um, and they've made, you know, good money uh, here uh, during uh, uh, our, our, our change in 2020 because uh, more of us are eating at home. Um, and same thing holds true for MSPs. Our call volume, our services to our customers have increased because of the shift. Um, now we're for most of us, we're kind of past the hard part of that um, because everybody's got to have been working from home by now. But as we start to look at 2021, you know, as you and I have talked about, all indications are um, that large portions of us aren't going back to the office, or if we are, it's going to be uh, part time, or uh, offices are going to change their structure, whether a hub and spoke model or um, whatever it may be. And so some of these challenges that we've had to overcome, we're going to see them crop up from time to time um, where, 
we know if a particular customer has a particular ISP, there may be an action we need to take um, when they run into thus and such an issue. Um, and we start to, uh, it builds our knowledge. One, from you just look from a knowledge management perspective, it builds our knowledge, but then we also build automatic remediations for those things. Um, mm -hmm. So that becomes you know, very, very helpful for us uh, uh, as, as uh, ISPs and um, uh, as a, uh, uh, a um, uh, as a provider to those customers. So we've been talking about I automate, and this isn't just runbook automation. This is intelligent runbook automation in reducing costs, mitigating risks, uh, and driving efficiency for our organizations. Um, Raj, I'd like to open uh, open up the floor for questions. Um, sure. and uh, uh, see if we have any questions out there we might be able to answer uh, uh, from the folks that have joined us today. Yeah, so we did have a few come in. Um, so one of the first ones that I'd like to kick us off with is what makes iAutomate different than other RBA and RPA tools that are on the market? Okay, I can kick that off. Um, so uh, there are uh, a lot of, um, well, RBA tools we work with, right? Like your IT PAMs of the world or the Ansibles of the world, because um, this is something that automates the RBA. Um, but uh, there are other solutions that also claim to uh, have intelligent automation. And one of the key distinctions between them, uh, we talked about a lot of things, the, the ability to expand your, your knowledge, the ability to find um, other solutions, um, the fact that it learns over time and grows in confidence. But if I was to pick one thing, uh, what I would pick is the fact that uh, iAutomate is powered by uh, natural language processing. Right. So a lot of the RBA solutions on the uh, the RBA automation solutions on the market um, out there today, um, they're more static. They're more um, you know a, a fancy. I'll, I'll call it regex string matching type um, approach. To, uh, uh, to remediation, which might work if you had, uh, as you alluded to Mike earlier, if you have a single uh, incident manager, you know exactly what error messages it generates, what incidents it creates, the incident text, the error codes, et cetera, um, then it's very easy to code for that. You may even be able to do that if you're just using some kind of string matching for a variety of these, but as you get into service requests where you have actual human operators uh, entering in, I need my mailbox size increased, right? Um, that's something where you need NLP to be able to understand um, that what, what that particular user is saying, because you might be able to uh, tweak the incident messages coming out of your incident managers. Uh, good luck trying to get your operators to enter something in a specific way using a specific text, right? So being able to use natural language processing to be able to understand uh, the, the event of the incident coming in or the service request or change request coming in, uh, the entity that is acting uh, on um, and the intent uh, of that particular uh, uh, message or that particular ticket, I think is very important. And so that's one of the key differentiators between some of the other intelligent automation solutions out there. And I think what you've just talked about, Raj, is really one of one of the primary differences is we're, 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 we, we've got an integrated artificial intelligence in this. Um, mm -hmm. you know, RBA and RPA tools um, are, are out there and they will follow the steps that we tell them to take and we can hook them up to different things and do some stiff different stuff, but they don't start to extrapolate that information. They're not gonna recommend a run mm -hmm. book to us based on uh, uh, those sort of things. That's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to take the, the steps we take, tell them to take. Right. And we've got run book automation built into i automate that's it's it's running a runbook it's you know not doing something super special what we're bringing to the table is this additional intelligence uh, right. to 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 help us uh better understand what may be happening and make those recommendations mm -hmm. where uh if it didn't match perfectly it didn't hit like you said you know from a from a regex or word matching perspective mm -hmm. it doesn't match 100 percent. it's not going right. to take that action um I automate is going to say, hey, this looks a lot like this, you know, and the human brain can certainly go, oh, yeah, you're right. Let me, let's do that um, yeah. and uh, take those actions. 
Uh, we're st we still have all the power of, of runbook capabilities. We still have all, and control, when you really think about it, right? Um, you, you have all that power and control, but we're adding this additional capability to, to do things in, in, in a, a much more functional, much broader way that represents really the constant change we face in IT. Uh, yep. it it's constantly evolving. Uh, and you know, I, I think about SCOM as an example. I you know, brought that up as a monitoring tool. Uh, depending upon what, what type of thing it's, it's uh, alerting on, and where it's alerting within SCOM, um, we see the output messages are different. Right. You know, and, right. and it can be about more essentially the same thing, but mm -hmm. they're actually different messages. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, exactly. when, when you first become a SCOM user and you're starting to to uh, look at the alerts that are being fired, you have you, you, you're you're having to interpret that alert and go, okay, wait a minute, yeah, that happened up here. This one's coming right. from down here. They kind of say the same thing, but they're formatted differently. Um, and right. they're telling us different information. Um, right. That's where we're bringing the AI. Because, well, hey, dude, these are the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm looking at this in a, in a broader way and much faster than we're able to to interpret it as well. Um, and yeah. then we start uh, interacting with the platform to start to drive that confidence level for certain solutions up. Um, mm -hmm. And and then it's more confident in, in, in showing us certain solutions and knowing that other ones may not necessarily apply because we're going to continue yeah. to build our library of things right. that we're, we're we're going to have available. And I look at it from an MSP perspective that what starts to drive where we're going to have solutions that we've built for another customer that become applicable to a customer who has yet to have had that challenge, problem, alert, whatever it may be. And so mm -hmm. we're able to kind of get that. Uh, that power uh, and yeah. that, uh, of course, multiplier of, hey, we've already kind of figured this out over here. We just, that was three months ago, and we just don't remember. Um, right. And it's so, so often just in general IT, you have that happen where, hey, it's been a while since we've seen this problem. I know somebody fixed this before. Does anybody remember what we did? Um, right. And we're able to kind of build, uh, you know, build out that knowledge uh, and mm -hmm. be able to share that knowledge. Uh, and so it becomes very, very powerful from an MSP perspective. Yeah. Tabitha, I think you had noted that there was another question as well. Yeah, there was another question. Um, could you change to the contact slide just as we kind of um, mm -hmm. close us out um, with a couple minutes left? So if resources are so strapped, then how would an MSP instrument intelligent automation? Uh, so, um, um, they kind of ended that yeah. with, uh, it could be a catch 22 because I have to free yeah. up so yeah, resources no, absolutely. and then yep. to free up resources. Right, right. Yes. Um, no, that, that's that's a good question. And um, uh, well, the the reality of it is that uh, you can do as much of the um, uh, execution and delivery and deployment of uh, iAutomate uh, as an intelligent automation solution as you'd like or as little of it as you like. Um, you know, and, and to some extent, that's where your friendly neighborhood MSP comes in. And, and so I'll defer to Mike, uh, you know, we're happy to do all of it for you, um, you know, and, and Mike can certainly talk to that. Yeah, it's, it, it's something that Excalibur, uh, as a partner with uh, Dry Ice and, and the iAutomate product, um, the iAutomates can be very, very quick to set up, very, very quick to bring value because we already start out of the box with, uh, a, I think it's 1,500 plus um, available runbooks um, on, on all kinds of different topics. Um, and then, of course, we have the backing and the support of Raj and the team at Dry Ice um, to help us make that solution whatever it is you need that solution to be uh, uh, from, uh, for, 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 for your organization. Um, uh, it, 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 by, by being able to bring those out-of-the-box runbooks um, to the table, you start to slash some of those things. It's gonna, we're gonna have to dedicate a little bit of time to set a few things up. Um, but once you are able to start to clear some of that noise, you start to free up more and more of the time. So you, you do have a catch-22 in the beginning, um, but you know, like every catch-22 you get into, you dedicate a little bit of time of effort, you start to clear the decks, and then right. now you're able to start to drive forward where what are other things that we have, and you start to, to well, we, what we've seen uh, in, in implementing uh, this tool is um, working with your L2s, your L3s to say, 
are there other things that we can do? Because I'm sure they have a list. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, I, I, if I could just get some time, I'd like to, to do this. If I just get some time, I can put the script out there. If I just get some time, um, what are those things that we can do? Um, and then you start to really uh, 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 get to that point where, where, where now you've, tur you've turned that frown upside down. Um, okay. you, you're, 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 you now have that, that time uh, to be able to focus on the things that are, that, are, that are important. But there's always that initial investment of time uh, in any uh, implementation of any new tool right. Um, but you know, uh, yeah. going into it, uh, I can tell you that the uh, ROI is going to be very quick um, yeah. because there's a whole bunch of, there, there, there's 1,500 plus things that potentially right. could, could impact you that we yeah. don't have to deal with. Yep. Yeah. These are already built, already thought through. Lots of people smarter than us have already put this stuff together. Yep. Yeah. And a very small investment of time can reap very large rewards. So. Well, Raj, thank you for joining us today uh, and sh sharing of your time and knowledge uh, with everyone out there. We want to thank everybody for joining us. Tabitha, we've had the, the uh, contact information up here. If there's additional information you need, uh, you'd like to reach out, please don't feel free to, to reach out to us here at Excalibur. Uh, we'll pull our friends uh, Raj and his team from Dry Ice in and uh, see what we can do to help you better automate and more intelligently automate your organization. Have a fantastic day. Thank you.